Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Dr. Muhammad Mudaffar from Prosthodontic Department. And uh, this course will be occlusion. And the title of uh, this lecture is uh, Introduction uh, to Dental Occlusion. Well, the textbooks that uh, they are going to read or most of the lecture is uh, from this textbook, which is Functional Occlusion in Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics. This is the new edition, edition of the same editors, which is the Klimberg. It is the occlusion and the clinical practice and evidence-based uh, approach. Well, let's start with the terminology, occlusion. Uh, there's, many uh, there's many definition, but simply, uh, you can say it is the act or process of closure or of being closed or shut off. Or another terminology from the glossary, for, uh, from the glossary of prosthodontic terms, it is uh, the static relationship between the incising or masticating surfaces of the maxillary or mandibular teeth or tooth analogues such as the crown bridges or uh, dental implants. Well, the articulation, uh, it is the static and dynamic contact relationship between the colossal surfaces of the teeth during function. So the difference between the articulation and the occlusion, uh, one of them it's static and one on the other one it's static and dynamic contact. Well, another terminology, it is the maximal intercuspal position or intercuspal position. Uh, it is the complete intercuspation of the opposing teeth. Uh, and dependent of condylar position, sometimes refers to as the best fit of the teeth, uh, regardless of the condylar position. So it is a tooth position, and it has no relation to the condyle, so it is a maximum intercuspation between the maxillary and the mandibular teeth. Well, Centric occlusion, it is the occlusion of the opposing teeth when the mandible is in centric relation. This may or may not coincide with the maximal intercuspal position. What does that mean? In some patients, when they occlude in the maximal intercuspation, uh, it does not uh, coincide with the centripulation or the, with the retruded contact position. It means that the centric occlusion or the maximal intercuspal position is slightly forward to the retruded contact position, which is about uh, 0.5 to 2 millimeters. But in 10% of patients, uh, uh, the centric occlusion is uh, coincide with the uh, maximal intercuspal position. Well, uh, let's say centric occlusion in another way. It is the intercuspal position when the jaw and condyle are in centric relation. Well, another terminology is the median occlusal position, or they call it the MOP is a clinically determined tooth contact position obtained by a snap jaw closer from a jaw open position. That, that means that when the patient open his mouth and ask him to quickly close his jaws, uh, this is called uh, the median occlusal position. Well, the, the retruded contact position the centriculation, it is the tooth contact position when the jaw are in the uh, retruded position. 
Well, an important definition in restorative dentistry and prosthodontics are familiar with this definition is the centric relation. Actually, there are many definitions for the centric relation, but I bring you this definition from the glossary of prosthodontic term 2017. They define it as the maxillomandibular relationship uh, and dependent of tooth contact in which the cone dial, as you can see in this figure, articulate in the anterior uh, superior position of the articular eminence. And in, and in this position, the mandible is restricted to a pure uh, rotary movement without any translation. It is it is unstrained physiological position, uh, and the patient uh, can make vertical, lateral, as well as protrusive movement. It is a very useful, repeatable, and it is regarded as a, a reference position. Well, this figure uh, show you that the centric relation. Uh, is equal to the center occlusion. It means that there is maximum intercuspation at the at the center collation. And in another word, the RCP, the truded contact position, is uh, equal to the intercuspal position. In some old textbook, they consider the center occlusion as the maximum intercuspal position. While in, uh, in this figures, the centric relation uh, is not equal to the center occlusion, or the rooted contact position is not coincide with the intercuspal position, and the patient should slide, move his mandible forward a little bit, about 0.5 to 2 millimeters, in order to achieve the maximum intercuspation. As you can see in this figure, the patient is in retruded contact position and there is no maximum intercuspation. While in this figure, the patient, uh, when he's, when he's, when his when he slide his mandible forward, there will be a maximum intercuspation. So the RCP is not equal to the ICP in this patient. Well, another terminology, it is what's called uh, freedom centric or long centric. Uh, this occur, the freedom centric or long centric, it is occur when the mandible is able to move anteriorly for a short distance in the same horizontal and sagittal plane while maintaining uh, tooth contact. As you can see in figure A, the, uh, such a tight occlusion between the cusp and the fossa, and there is no horizontal overjet, uh, the palatal contour of the maxillary teeth is in a tight contact with the lower one, so there is no freedom in centric or long centric. While in figure B, there is some distance. The cast to fossa relation is not very tight, and there is some uh, space uh, that the patient could move in the sagittal plane or in, or in the mesodistal direction. And also the overjet and the convexity of the palatal surface of the posterior teeth, uh, it may allow the patient to move uh, uh, his mandible a little bit, about 0.5 to 1 millimeters in a forward or a medial lateral direction. This is called uh, a long centric or freedom in centric. A tight occlusion or no freedom in centric is most occurring in patient with a glass 2 division 2 mile occlusion. Well, Another definition regarding uh, the lateral jaw position uh, is as of as the following. We have the working side and the non-working side or the balancing side. So 
the working side. It is the side toward which the mandible move in a lateral excursion. Say that I move my mandible to the right side, so the right side will be the working and the other side will be the non-working side. Well, the tooth contact at the working side, they call it the working side contact, or they call it the lateral, the lateral trusive uh, side contact. Well, the non-working side, or the balancing side, it is the side of the mandible that moves toward the median line in a lateral excursion. And the condyle on that side, they call it the non-working side condyle or the balancing condyle. And the tooth contact in the non-working side, they call it the non-working side contact or the medial or the mediotrusive contact side or the balancing side contact. Well, this figure shows you the lateral mandibular movement when the mandibles moves, uh, as you see, according to the arrows, this side will be the working side and the other side will be the non-working or the balancing side. Well, the condyle on the non-working side or the balancing side, uh, the path of this condyle will be uh, downward and inward while the working side, it will uh, rotate only a pivot. They call it the pivot condyle or the rotated condyle. Well, as you can see in this figure, the upper slide uh, is the working side contact and the lower is the balancing side contact. Well, actually in natural dentition, uh, it is desirable to have a working side contact, as you can see, and this is called a group function occlusion. That means there is a multiple occlusal contact with the canine premolars and molars. While the lower slide shows you a balancing tooth contact, which is not desirable for uh, natural dentition, and it is regarded as interf uh, occlusal interferences. And in the contrary, if you are going to construct a, a complete denture, such a closer scheme is desirable. Uh, in, other world, in another world, we should have uh, a working and balancing contact in artificial uh, complete denture dentition. While I repeat, in the natural dentition, uh, we have contact at, uh, at the working site and the contact at the balancing is regarded as uh, occlusal uh, interference. Well, as you can see in this figure, as I said, the contact on the working side, uh, we either have a group function occlusion in which there is a multiple tooth contacts, or as you can see, or we can, we, or we can have a canine guided occlusion or canine protected occlusion in which uh, the canine on the working side will disocclude uh, the posterior teeth, as you can see in this figure. Well, as you can see in this figure, it shows you the tooth contact and the lateral trusive side or the working side contact and the tooth contact and the medial trusive contact or the non-working or the balancing contact. So, in the lateral trusive of contact, we have contact between uh, the buccal cusp of the maxillary mandibular teeth and the palatial cusp in incline of the, of the upper and the lingual cusp of the lower. And on the medial trusive side, we have a contact between the palatal cusp of the maxillary teeth and the buccal cusp of the lower teeth. Such a closal scheme is rarely found in natural teeth and if it is found is regarded as closal interference but uh, it is a, a very useful type if we are going to make uh, a complete dangers to have a contact on the working and uh, well this figure show you the 
the occlusion and natural teeth. So we have a uh, working side, this is a canine protective occlusion in which the canine will disocclude the posterior teeth and uh, at MB this is the the balancing side or the non-working side there is a disocclusion in the posterior teeth and C this is when the patient protrudes uh, his mandible forward there is contact in the anterior teeth and, the, and there is disocclusion of the posterior teeth well, another terminology is the Bennett movement. Uh, it is a term that describes lateral movement of the lateral trusive condyle or the working uh, condyle. While the Bennett angle, uh, it is the angle of the contralateral condyle or, or, or the balancing of the non-working condyle on the medial trusive side. Uh, as you can see in this figure, uh, the Bennett movement is illustrated as a bodily shift movement of the mandible. Uh, the boys on the right side uh, push the mandible in a forward, downward and a medial direction. And, and the boy on the left side try to push it laterally toward him. So this is the Bennett movement. It is a bodily shift of the mandible toward the lateral side or toward the working side. While the angle that is formed between the balancing condyle, the path of the balancing condyle, and the sagittal planes, as you can see, the angle between the black and red arrow, this is the, call it the, the Bennett angle, and it is about 10 degrees and the bodily shift of the mandible or the Bennett movement is uh, the, the average of this is about uh, 0 0.75 to 0.75 millimeters uh, to 1 millimeters as an average and uh, a special instrument is used to to record this uh, Bennett movement they call it the pantograph and it is important if, the, if someone is uh, interested in full mouth rehabilitation with fixed bridges and fully adjustable articulator and then he should record uh, the Bennett movement by uh, pantograph. Well, one can imagine that the masticatory or the stomatognathic system is generally considered to be made up of three parts and these are the teeth which is composed from enamel, pulp and the dentin and the periodontal tissue which is composed from gingivae, periodontal membrane and the bone and the articulatory system which is the TMJ occlusions and muscles. And once again, one could imagine that the articulatory system, which is composed from the TMJ, which is considered at the hinge of the system, and the masticatory muscle is considered as the motor of this system, and the dental occlusion is regarded as the contact of this system. Well, this is a small irritation how how the changes in, uh, in any part of the system will affect the other. So any change in the TMJ, it will lead to change in the occlusion and the masticatory muscle. And any changes in the muscle lead to changes in the occlusion and TMJ. And the occlusion will also affect uh, the TMJ and the masticatory muscles and so on. Well, the requirement of stable occlusion and natural teeth, uh, we as uh, we should have stable stops, and all teeth when condyle are in centric relation, and disocclusion of posterior teeth in protrusive mandibular movement, and disocclusion of the posterior teeth on the working side during lateral exclusive movement in case of canine protected occlusion and disocclusion of posterior teeth on the non-working side 
during exclusive lateral movement and coincidence between center collision and center collision and center collusion or the truded or the truded caspal position and or the intercaspal position Uh, in case of ideal bite, we should have point contact of the maxillary, posterior, lingual cusp tips and the mandibular posterior buccal cusp tips to the central fossae or marginal ridges of the opposing posterior teeth and the forces should be exerted through the long axis of the teeth and normal buccal positioning of the maxillary buccal cusp should be outside or buccal to the mandibular teeth. Well, the possible sign of non-ideal occlusion is jiggling and loosening of teeth. It means that uh, the tooth is uh, mobile, migration and drifting with the resulting open contact, excessive tooth wear, non-curious cervical notching such as abfraction, uh, misalignment of the affected teeth, sensitive or tender teeth, fracture and cracking and so on well we shift to another topic which is the clinical occlusal assessment uh, and the treatment and planning and assessment of the teeth and their relationship with the jaw muscle system is an integral part of the diagnosis and a broad distribution of tooth contact it will disperse forces uh, from function and parafunction over many teeth and uh, it will reduce the force concentration on uh, a limited number of teeth. Well, regarding the assessment of occlusal analysis, we should uh, identify the retruded contact position, which is the RCP, and the ICP, which is the intercuspal contact position, and the MOP, which is the median occlusal position, which is the dynamic equivalent of the ICP. Well, the clinical assessment of tooth contact is important in case of restorative and prosthodontic treatment planning and it requires patient confidence in determining the jaw position with guidance and he should use a high quality ultra fine uh, uh, marking tape such as one produced by the Avoclar Vivident uh, German to accurately determine tooth contact and uh, jaw well ultra fine tape uh, is recommended to, minima to minimize contact artifact and clearly indicate tooth contact details. As well, a practical approach in a clinical assessment of tooth, uh, of tooth contact, we should use different color for convenience, such as the red, a black, and green tape uh, is only suggested for comparisons. Well, the requirement for clinical occlusal adjustment involve the use of three type of, uh, of marking foils, the black, red, and green, to mark teeth in a specific sequence, and the use of a special holder, we call it the Miller holder, to support the foil for bilateral assessment, and we should have a gauze to dry teeth to allow ultrafine tape to mark the teeth and uh, the patient is seated in a dental chair with uh, it's very important and appropriate lighting and the patient should be uh, the assessment should be carried out while the patient is lying in supine position or maybe seated in upright and a dental assistance is very helpful for supporting the marking tape in the middle hole. Well, for tooth contact identification, different color as suggested. For the MOP or the median occlusal position, uh, a red tape is suggested 
to be distinct from the RCP contact or the root contact position while for the RCP contact uh, a black tape uh, is suggested and for the shift from the RCP to ICP it may be examined by also by a, a black tape by having the patient bite after the initial contact in the RCP and the lateral guidance is marked with a green tape to be distinct from the MOP and the R well, how to guide uh, the patient into the, the retruded contact position? We have many approaches, uh, either by using the, uh, the chin method or chin and jaw method in which the operator uh, stand in front of the patient or using uh, bilateral jaw guidance by uh, the, in such a case the operator stand uh, behind the patient and will hold, and he will hold the patient uh, mandible through both his hand by using the index by story by using the thumb the thumb and all of, and all his fingers uh, below the patient mandible uh, to guide him into uh, the retruded uh, contact well these figures show you how to record the retruded contact position and in this case the operator is using the bilateral guidance approach and by using his thumb and his fingers to guide the mandible and he's standing behind the patient and the assistant is holding the Miller holders with the marking tape and the definite uh, tooth contact will be marked sh uh, sh so sharply as you can see uh, this picture on the premolars and uh, molars and the, and the color will be a black in identification of the retruded contact uh, position. Well, for identification for the MOP or the median occlusal position, which is the dynamic equivalent for the intercuspal position, uh, the patient is asked uh, to open and the operator is holding the middle holder with a red uh, marking tape and he asks the patient to quickly close his mandible in order to mark tooth contact in the M. Well regarding the median occlusal position as you can see it is uh, marked by a red color to be distinguished from the black color which is uh, for the RCP when both the, the black and red color are identical in their position this is good for the occlusion uh, for the patient it means that the slide from the icp uh, sorry the slide from the rcp to the icp is little when both of them are identical well for identification of lateral tooth contact so a gentle guidance by the operators by the operator from the RCP uh, to the working side on the balancing side on the protrusive side uh, to mark uh, the tooth contact on the working side and if there is any interference on the balancing, on the balancing side and also to mark uh, the protrusive tooth contact by using uh, a green tape to be the to be distinguished from the red for the MOP and the black for the RCP. Well, another object is the parafunctional tooth where, as you know that uh, parafunction is term used to describe uh, those jaw movement not related to function. And to be more specifically, it is not related to mastication, swallowing speech, uh, facial expression, and so on.
Well, functional jaw movement of chewing, swallowing, and speech uh, involve only relatively short duration of tooth contact, while the parafunctional clenching is most commonly occur while the patient is awake, and they call it the awake proxism and appears to be driven by uh, a psychological factors generated during the daytime uh, stress and mood changes may, may uh, increase these parafunctional uh, habits well episodic daytime clenching is of uh, Longer duration than sleep proxism episode. Well, well, when a clinching occurs during sleep, they call it a sleep proxism, and could be related to many factors such as uh, uh, body position, snoring, apnea, hypopnea episode, breathing difficulty, uh, and hypertension. As well, sleep proxism is characterized by uh, masticatory activity or they call it the rhythmic <coughs> the rhythmic masticatory activity which mean repetitive jaw muscle contraction with or without tooth contact and is defined as a movement sleep disorder or parasomnia as is in snoring well, the parafunction, it could be tooth contact, a parafunction, which include jaw clinching, which has happened in centric, they call it centric proxism, and we have uh, jaw grinding or proxism, which occur in, in, in a lateral protrusive direction, and also we have tapping of teeth, many times open and close the mandible and tap his teeth, and we have forced posture of the jaw in case of a glass to relation and the patient try to to lock his teeth forward uh, this is called a forced posture uh, parafunction and also we have uh, non-tooth contact jaw posture which include uh, holding the, the jaw in a fixed posture without tooth contact in order to improve the facial aesthetic and in case also of pipe smoking, nail biting, pencil biting and thumb or finger sucking particularly. <coughs> well, the clinical study provides stroke evidence that parafunction and proxism uh, are not caused by local dental factor that is, there is no association between tooth arrangement or tooth contact but it is uh, rather related to the central nervous system and it is recognized as a sleep disorder or parasomnia and there is a study done by Lopezo in 2013 he proposed the concept of a paroxysm uh, as it is presenting with two circadian rhythm associated with the etiology of awake and sleep proxism that means it happened in the same day at the same times so they call it the circadian uh, rhythm where for a closer analysis uh, this is a case sheet uh, that is used for the closer analysis and this is a magnification of the of the seat of the sorry of the sheet that is used for the occlusal analysis. Well, the parafunctional clinical signs may be on the teeth, which is recognized as a wear on teeth and restoration, and the degree of wear on the teeth will depend on the enamel hardness and the forces generated and their duration also the frequency of the habit mobility and spreading of teeth fracture cusp and split teeth 
Well, the, the, the parafunctional signs on the muscle include muscle pain, uh, muscle hypertrophy, especially masseters, and elevated masseter electromyography. And regarding the TMJ, there will be possible overloading or articular sounds such as popping and clicking and internal uh, well, it has been reported that the degree of, of attrition does not increase in a linear manner with age. And the canine uh, will uh, protect the posterior teeth from attrition. But once the attrition on the canine is in progress, uh, it means that the rate of posterior attrition will be increased. So the canine, it will protect the teeth in case of canine protected occlusion. But once the canine abraded, uh, it will no longer protect the posterior teeth and the rate of posterior teeth attrition uh, will be uh, increased. Well, it has been reported that approximately uh, 75 to 80% of tooth wear Attrition is attributed to parafunction and the, remainder, and the remainder to function, including the erosion. And the loss of teeth structure varies widely in different individuals. And it is a function of the duration of tooth contact episodes, uh, frequency of parafunctional episodes, uh, bite force that is developed, and whether there is a static clenching or dynamic uh, grinding of two surfaces and also uh, it is related to abrasion resistance and uh, mineral content of enamel. Well, this picture show you, uh, show you uh, uh, loss of teeth uh, which is related to, to the phenomena of attrition. <clears throat> and uh, another object is the propagation test. Well, the propagation test is is very useful component for the occlusal assessment, and they are used to provoke a response in the teeth, jaw, muscle, or TMJ uh, or TMJ joint. Well, regarding the TMJ propagation test. Uh, and in such test, uh, the patient is asked to bite on a unilateral posterior contact, uh, such as on a cotton roll or wooden spatula of 2 mm thickness. And the patient should, be, uh, should bite uh, on one side for, a half, uh, for half minutes or 30 seconds. After that, the patient may feel pain or discomfort may be experienced on the contralateral joint. That means if the patient bite on the cotton wool on the right side for 30 seconds, he may feel pain on the left side as, as a result of the compression or tension of the joint. While the epsilateral joint, it means the, the side that the patient bite, it may be under tension, uh, with possible destruction of the condyle. Or this test might reveal nothing. The patient will, uh, this test will not provoke uh, any, symptom, any symptoms or concern to the Well, regarding the jaw muscle provocation test, the patient is asked to bite in center occlusion or intercuspal position uh, for 30 seconds. Uh, the patient may feel pain, discomfort, or muscle fatigue uh, that may be provoked and may be similar to the symptom that the patient experienced in the head, face, or jaw. This uh, suggests that a clinching habit may be related to such symptoms. Or alternatively, or alternatively this test may not provoke any symptoms or concern. Well, the proxy facet or the wear facet, uh, where there is evidence of tooth wear, 
clinching on opposing proxy facet on maxillary and mandibular teeth for 30 seconds and the patient will reproduce this habit and the proxy facet or rear facet on the anterior teeth can be provoked when the patient is asked to protrude or in to protrude his mandible or in, uh, in a lateral protrusive uh, position and the patient is often unaware of this uh, job posture and he may be surprised at the forced and often uncomfortable nature of the uh, jaw position and thank you for your kind listening